So we just had the NFL draft, and so we're going to stay on the topic of football. As we welcome you into the show, I'm Brian Fenley. I'm on Twitter, at Brian Fenley. Our guest is someone whose last name is as flashy as his game while he was a UCLA Bruins running back. Bolu Olorumfami, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for doing this. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's been a while, so <laughs> it's, been, it's, it's nice to talk about good things. Exactly, especially in the times we are in right now. And this, Bolu, is something that I've started to do because I think this podcast can give Bruin fans something to take their mind off right. their, their lives right now and what's going on. And my question for you right out of the gate here is, in your ordinary life, people come up to you how many times and say, are you that guy who jumped 30 feet in the air against Oregon? <laughs> honestly no one really no one has never actually recognized me so it's just it's, it's I feel like because you know I had a helmet on and you know now I have dreads they weren't as long last time sure. so I feel like maybe you know they maybe might think it is and they don't want to you know but in my in my experience no I've never really had anyone except if they're like a Bruin fan and they already know who I am and they're just like what were you thinking and I'm like <laughs> I don't know I just said it Let's be flashy today and just jump. <laughs> but no, on a regular day basis, no, a lot of people really don't recognize it. Recognize well, it. They recognize the highlight, though, I think for sure. And Bolu is on Twitter at the only Bolu. So follow him on there. You've probably been asked this a few times before, but yeah. I want to hear exactly when into the thought process of you levitating in the air and soaring 10 to. Goodness, how long or how high you did in the air to get to the goal line and score that touchdown against Oregon? That's that's a great question. Honestly, now that we finally have this platform and it's been a couple of years, really, because I was I, I don't know if you noticed, I posted a picture just like a day ago of that picture of me yeah. like, as I was going up. And I really noticed, I'm like, dang. And I'm like, now I remember what I was trying to do. I, I honestly thought I could clear them. Wow. I, I would really thought because if you look at the picture, the dude's the dude's shoulder pad is the only reason why I didn't clear him. Yeah. So that's why when he stood up, I went up. But if I oh. if I would have got that leg up just a little bit more, I would have just cleared him. That was yeah. just, I was just trying to hurdle. I was just like, let me just jump over him. And even though like I could have just went right, I could have went left and walked in. But <laughs> I was like, what good is that gonna do me? <laughs> yeah. I, I want to be remembered somehow. Sure. You know? Honestly, looking back on it, I'm. I'm I'm very happy that you know that's something that I I was able to leave at UCLA. I know like during my tenure it was a tough it was a tough couple of years you know switching coaches and our win record and our loss record and all that. Mm. I really am just happy that I was able to you know have something that I can remember from there you know because I, I like I tell a lot of fans and I tell everyone I gave my all you sure. know I gave what I could and to look back at it, I, it it's something I can be proud of you know and, and that was a perfectly blocked play. By by the line let's let's not talk about let's not forget about them yes Scotty Q pulling Najee I remember he was pulling it was just open so all that was all them you know and then the last part I can say was just randomly me it just came out just all right let's jump over him. but I really thought I could clear him honestly wow I swear to God I thought I could clear him. <laughs> I like if my cleat didn't get stuck in I would have just like I would have cleared him yeah. If you look at the picture, it's like I, I, I even I looked at it, I was like, that's what I was trying to do. Uh -huh. really, I don't know why I was doing it. And I but the thing is I was going so fast and I felt yeah. like I felt like I could like go on I could jump over the damn goalpost. So Absolutely. I was, so I was just like, all right, let's try it. And I just did it. I just did it. Because if if people actually noticed, um, was it two or three weeks prior against Hawaii, I actually that's tried right. to that's right. I was going to bring that up. Yeah. yeah. So like, I actually tried to really do it there. That one hurt. Like I had this, I hurt my like little back. It was something in my back. It was hurting for like a couple of weeks, but that one hurt more than that. The Oregon one, the Oregon one, I, it, I felt like it was so much adrenaline. Just yeah. Not, and if you actually notice, I thought I fumbled. So like wow. I was grabbing the ball. If, if you see like after when I jumped, I, I was like, Oh, sh oh snap ball, the ball. Yeah. So I got on the ball. Cause I was thinking, Oh, I fumbled it. Like, yeah. I, sh I shouldn't have fumbled it, but obviously it was a touchdown at the time. But the way my mind with process was going was like, oh, I got to take care of the ball. Whereas Oregon, I mean, uh, Hawaii, I was just like, because I, I wasn't really, I hadn't really got a lot of carries. So I was just like, you know what? I need to do something. 
crazy. Which sure. Is like how Oregon, because like really people don't really understand me and so so we were, we had like just the amount of the same amount of yards that game. So it was kind of like one two punch. Like oh you did that I got you. I'm gonna one up you. Like help the competition. <laughs> yeah. He, he actually scored before I scored that touchdown. So I'm like all right cool. <laughs> yeah, I got you, bro. So that's really the reason why I did. Wow. I just, Flashy. Same with Hawaii because there was like what five running backs. So it's like as a, when I got my chance, I'm like I'm just gonna do something just wild right now. So Hawaii, I was just like I was so close, but I didn't even know what I was doing. I just jumped, <laughs> hoping like I get in. But that's really the story behind those things. Wow. I always try to be like flashy because just like anyone can, you know, we we could all get a ten yard game, we could all get a fifty yeah. yard game, we could all get a touchdown. But how did you do it? You know, what's gonna be remembered? The one where you just walked in, or the one where you jumped over on top of somebody. So, yeah, you you are immortalized for that. And I'm curious to hear when you got back to the sideline after this, oh, and yeah. the amount of reaction you got from your teammates and your coaches. What was the wildest <laughs> thing somebody said to you after you scored that touchdown and levitated in the air? Honestly. My teammates were more like, "Was you good, bro? Like, <laughs> whoa. Because like, really, when I saw the film, yeah, I could have literally went right, right, like jump cut to the right or cut back and just walk yeah. in. But in my mind, I swear the only thing I, I optioned was jump. So I get back to the sideline. And, like, I remember I remember the running backs coming up to me. And, like, they dapped me up for the tug. And they're just like, bro, what were you, what were you thinking? <laughs> and I was like, honestly, I don't know. They're like, hey. You did that, though. And I'm like, I guess. And, like, my coaches were like, I remember Coach Foster was just like, be careful. Like, <laughs> be careful. Because I, yeah. I don't know if people also noticed, the next game we played at Washington, there was a play where it was open field, and I was I was, I was, was about to jump again. But yeah. I actually ended up kicking the guy in the helmet and flipping. I don't know if you've ever saw that play. It's actually in one of my – if you look up, it's somewhere Yeah, I'll check it out. Yeah. So it's like I was actually gonna jump over. It was two guys. I was. It was like it was. I think it was the. It was a play. It was a flip play. It was a fake uh, fullback play. Fullback dive flip to me. It was like a fourth and one or a third and one. Sure. And it was open grass, and I'm going, and I just keep remembering from last week, like the coach telling me, like, <laughs> be careful, like, come on, like, be careful. And so as I'm running, my leg starts to rise up. I'm like, I'm just going to do it. Because there's two DBs coming down. Yeah. I could have literally, if I would have did it, they would have just hit each other. And maybe sure, I could've, sure. I would have cleared and maybe stumbled and maybe kept my feet and scored. But then I was just like, no, 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 no. Coach going to get mad at me. So I literally just put my leg out there and just just stop all my body movement. And one hit, one when the one DB hit me this way and the other DB hit me this way, I kind of they kind of hit each other. And I just, my leg hit one helmet and I just flipped. I'm just like, whoa. I still don't understand how that happened. I feel like I should have broke my leg off of that, but wow. it, it was because I didn't want to I didn't want to jump. I just yeah. the way I play sometimes is just like I just get excited. I'm just gonna do something, you know, something I've never if you go look at my film in high school, I think I heard it maybe two times. Wow. I'm just that type of player where it's just if I feel like I'm gonna do it, I'm just gonna do it. Like, you know, spontaneous, but yeah. <laughs> Your last name, as we said, is as flashy as your game. You are simply living up to your last name and what that brings. And Bolo Oloramfami is joining us here on the podcast. Follow him on Twitter at the only Bolo, which is an awesome Twitter handle, by the way, because when it comes to what we need to talk about, you are the only Bolu, and you are one of a kind on the football field. Story behind that one, that's my third Twitter. By the way, I actually. Yeah, oh gosh, what's was, this? What's this backstory? I finally, got this name that I wanted. I think I had UCLA twenty when I was a freshman. Okay. Y O U S E E L A twenty. Like that was my first handle when I first got to UCLA. And then I, when I changed my number, I changed it to something. Like it was number four. I changed it to something else. And I had like a good following on there, like three thousand. And then I just went through this little dark time. Like nah, I'm done. I just deleted it. Yeah. And I came back senior year, and I'm just like, all right, I'm going to create this Twitter. This is going to be the one that – this is the last one. I can't this is the last one. After this, I'm, I'm, I just can't get it on anymore. So I'm like, all right, what is going to be my name? And like, well, who's the only me? Me, the only Bolu. So I just, just tried it out, and it worked. The only Bolu. I'm like, perfect. And a lot of times it's hard to find creative 
original Twitter handles like that. So glad that you found that. And Bolu, when you were first interested in playing football, what I recall hearing is that your parents were like, I don't know, Bolu, is this the thing for you? Should you be doing this? So we talk about all the stuff you did while at UCLA, but how much of a, a reality was it that you might not have even played the game because of your parents trying you trying for you not to do that? That is a huge reality. I tell a lot of people, um, my parents didn't let me play in eighth grade. So I was playing from fifth grade. I played elementary to seventh grade. And my parents were strict. Like, you got to, like, read your books. They say, if you yeah. want to do what you want to do, study first. And so one summer, oh, I still, it's a very funny story. I'm happy we have this time. Oh, I'm love it. For the world is. So I always tell people the reason why I didn't play football in eighth grade is because I went back for a piece of bread. So let me explain what I mean by I went back for a piece of bread. So like I told you, my parents during the summer, we had sure. to read. They, had, they would go to the store, buy the books, have us read it, do the questions, everything. Like I, wow. We had class in my house, literally. Like that's how it was. So I won't lie. I, got, I kind of was being rebellious. I didn't do a couple pages for like a week or two. So it was just a normal day. It started towards nighttime. It's like I was about to, this is like I said, I was supposed to go to bed. And I was just like, no, nah, I want to go get a piece of bread. My dad was there. It was just my dad, my mom, my brother. I think my brothers were upstairs. And I go back to grab the piece of bread. I'm just chilling eating the piece of bread. And my dad's like, have you been doing your work? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. I'm like, and I get start, heart started beating like, yo, I haven't been doing it. And then he's like, let me see it. So I bring it. He goes through it. And he's like, all right, you're not playing football. Anymore. Wow. Wow. Like, no, it was, I wrote a letter to him and everything. Like, I was like, I'm sorry. I'll do do better. We even went to uh, Universal Studios and he still then He was just like, no, you're not playing football. And I think that was really from like, they didn't really want me to play football. So it was like, they just used the excuse yeah. of I didn't do my work. But like, it's just a funny story because I went back for that piece. If I didn't go to that, get that piece of bread, he probably wouldn't have asked me that day. And who knows, I probably would have caught up. And and honestly, during that time, I was really more defensive minded. I was actually supposed to be like, I love playing linebacker. So I always tell people too, like, if I would have continued to play from eighth grade on, I think I would play linebacker. But when when I took that year off, and I kind of was like, because when you take time off from football, you kind of look at hits differently. And I'm just like, I don't know if I want to hit him like that, or I don't know if I'm good at tackling. I think I think I'd rather like have the ball that way I can evade tacklers. So I just sure. be full on running back, like. You can't find any film of me ever playing defense, ever, in my career. I just literally played <clears throat> straight running back, and that's how my school kept it. That's how my school treated me, too. And, you know, I mean, thank God for them. I rushed for 6,000 yards and helped me get the exposure to be it, go to places like UCLA and get offers from good places. But that's just really how I was. I played one position literally my whole wow. life. So, And I feel like also recruiting-wise and, like, you know, Coach is looking at me why it's not like I'm not this is not like hate or anything. It's just like yeah. they kind of see me as one dimensional. Sure. And I don't blame them because I mean if you look at if you look at you know the tape and everything, I haven't played anything else. But in my mind, I feel like I can do way more than that, which is why I was hurdling random people and and doing stuff like that because I just I feel like I'm so much capable of more and I want to prove myself more than just being a bruising back or a fourth down and one back. I hated hearing those things. That's the one reason why I didn't go to Stanford. When they offered me and we went there, wow. and they're like, oh, wow, you'll be a great third down back. Not understanding what third down back really means NFL term wise, but I took it as, oh, you want me to be the big guy to just go get the first down. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I, sure. I, I always see myself as, you know, um, balanced, you know. Totally. And I've always felt like I've had to prove myself in all types of ways. But like I said, it comes down to that. I, I think it's just people think I'm so one-dimensional, you know, in a way. And I don't blame them at all. But I always try to work on my on my, on my my craft. Like, when I got to UCLA, I couldn't catch the ball for my life. like Because I never was thrown the ball. Sure. But as I learned and as I got better, I could catch the ball. But you know what? Because of the fact that I haven't been catching the ball from my past, it hurt me going in because now the coaches were like, oh, okay, you're, you're, we don't want you in when it's time to a pass down, you know? And I don't blame them, you know, because they haven't seen it enough of me just, you know, nothing. Like Arizona State, when I caught those balls and I took – and it was like – that was my biggest game ever. Like, 
that was just those are the little if you look at my career they're like little things like little spurts and it just that just shows like you know that's me trying to um further and better myself and show people i'm not one dimensional like i can catch the ball if you believe in me enough and have faith in me enough i will catch the ball but if you're just like oh no we don't want you on passing downs it it messes with your mental as a sure. football player it, it kind of does because it's like man coach coaches don't believe you know that i can catch the ball and i spent a lot of like my years like literally learning to catch the ball especially when you play with josh rosen you have to know how to catch the ball it's so crazy. i understood that so that's just an example of you know something i had to improve on like i felt like catching the ball in my speed were the, the two big things for me at ucla that i had to like work on and always keep up at a high level because if i get slow or if i don't catch the ball my chances of playing are not it's not going to happen here so I, I, I knew I had to focus on those things. It made me better. Like, I mean, to this day, I feel like I have speed. Um, if, I, if I were to go out there and play catch, I feel like I can catch the ball, all because of the things I had to work on at UCLA. But it was all a blessing. I, I wonder, Bolu, how much of this drive that you have for football came because you were out that one year in eighth grade and how that only fostered more of your desire to, to want to play this game. And then the way you inject your personality out there, like you said, you want to be known as a multidimensional guy. You like to have a little flair. You like to have that as well. And like you said earlier, there were times where you were, you were able to show that in spurts. And then there were times where you wish you could, but sometimes an injury got in the way. And what do you think, when you, when you kind of look back at your total career, because we know how talented you are, Bolu, and then you think, well, my senior year, how would you have wanted to, to see that end differently? My senior year, shoot. I mean, there's it's a lot of factors, you know, and I think I think it just pan it went the way it went because I believe I'm a loyal person. I believe that I believe that if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna see it through. Because I mean, I'm not gonna lie, you've seen a lot of people transfer. We've seen that. Yeah. We've seen that we've seen how everything started to change once you, you kind of change the culture of things. And you can't blame anyone because like we all were under a different coach. It's sure. like it's like having a different father and then now you you're getting a stepfather. It's like, well, I didn't choose this, you know? Yeah, for sure. I, I chose to not be like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna show that one, I'm coachable. I can adapt, I can learn. It goes back to everything I was telling you before. Like I had four different offensive coordinators. I've I've literally had to be a power back, I literally had to learn how to catch the balls, kind of have a little bit of speed, like speed back wise. I mean, mm -hmm. Coach Kelly runs are very fast. You have to be fast, you know what I'm saying? So I had to learn all those things. I, I have adapted. My body has been a 215. My body's been a 220. My body's been a 230. I've, wow. I've, people don't know that, though. I've, I've, I've torn my, my, my labrum in my shoulder my sophomore year and never got surgery on it and played on it. Wow. Like, because I believe that if I – if I got surgery and sat out for six months, I would have lost my spot. Yep. I mean, you had people like Nate Stark, Sosa Jamabo, Jalen Starks, Brandon Stevens. Like, these are guys that are really good guys, you know. Like, And the only way I felt that I would give them an advantage is if I wasn't there. I feel yep. like – because, like, these are competitive guys, and they made me who I am, like, to be honest with you. Like, I'm still very, very close to these guys, and we went through a lot together. But I, at the same time, I didn't want to lose the opportunity, you know, I always felt like I was one step away from going to the NFL. Just yeah. before going to UCLA. I mean, that's literally how I meant how I how I felt. Like I'm one step away. Like the NFL is right there. Like, and that's just how I felt my entire four years. And that's also um, why I didn't feel like I need to go anywhere. I don't need to leave just because you know things are going bad or things are changing right now. I'm just gonna stick it out. And that's you know at the end of the day, I feel like I would have done that no matter what, you know, and, and I know it, I, I would have wanted to finish differently, obviously, obviously, but it's weird. Every time I try to think about it, it's just like, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't see anything. I feel like maybe that was my, my path. Maybe that was yeah. it, you know? And, and I feel like other people grew. Like I, I tell people about Josh Kelly, like I don't people, I don't think people understand. There were days, I still have videos in my phone three years ago, me and him working out. Like, no one's out there. Just me and him grinding and wow. him running on his own. Like, to see him yesterday getting drafted, that was huge for me. Like, for me, 
I don't want to say I live vicariously through anyone, but for me, seeing him, somebody who came as, you know, kind of under us, uh, uh, from UC Davis, not in a way like he's, he's below us, but catching up, you know what I mean? Yeah. And to, be able to, to be able to not catch up, but not to be able to not only catch up, but to surpass and to do great things that haven't been done in a long time. I love it. And, you know, th- that makes me happy to see Josh Kelly do that. And, um, it just makes it, it kind of makes me happy because like people are always like UCLA's run game sucks. UCLA run game sucks. Now I can just be like Josh Kelly. What do you yeah. mean? He, two years he was doing this thing. You know, we finally found it. I felt like for us we were just going. There were so many styles of running, and you know there wasn't consistency. If, sure. You know what I mean? You know. Yeah. So I feel like for him it was just consistency that gave him the opportunity. And once he saw the opportunity and saw how good he was. He be able to ma- He was able to master and, and repeat again. I mean, thousand yard seasons re- re- repeating back to back. That's that's to me. I, I don't care who you are. That's amazing. So, um, no matter what would happen my senior year, I'm still very happy because someone found their shines. Someone found their way. It, it wasn't like it would have been different if everyone, if there was never a running back for the for even when I was there that ever did anything. Everyone was struggling, and no one did anything. It was just like, oh, run game sucks, da 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 da. But no, someone found a groove. Someone found a way. So, you know, I'm happy. I'm happy because I I ran behind the same old lineman he ran behind. Yeah. So it makes me feel good. You know, the practice time we had. You know, the times we studied together. The times we talked together. The times we can. Uh, uh, con- uh, I forgot the word. The times we consoled each other. You know, totally. Yeah. So it's it's, it's to me. I mean. I'm, I'm happy no matter what because people are succeeding, you know, and, and I think I said this in my last post on Instagram is like my path was not what I thought it was going to be, you know, um, so that I can't sit here and, you know, be like, ah, oh, I should be in that, I should be playing. No, I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the next year and a half. No one knew coronavirus is going to stop yeah. all, all sports, you know, so who knows what could happen. So I feel like, that's why I advise a lot of people just embrace the journey. Don't, don't fight it. And what I mean by don't fight it is like for me, for example, it's like last year when all I thought was I'm going to go to the NFL. I didn't give anything, uh, any other thought. I didn't have an open mind. So I just, I kept fighting it. I kept fighting it. And I try to do other things. I try to move away to Miami and try to do things my own way when I should have embraced the journey because if I would have embraced the journey, I would have seen what, you know, God has in store for me or what I should be doing with or the things that I see myself doing, like, and and that's why I advise that for so many guys because I feel like if you don't embrace the journey and you and it doesn't turn out the way you uh, want it to happen, you have regrets because you didn't embrace the journey. You try to do it your own way. You try to fight it instead of just going with it and having that same worth and mind, mindset, but also having an open mind and understanding the world. The world is unexpected. Things things can not go your way. You always have to be prepared for that. So um, it, at the end of the day, I, I, I really feel like that's what it comes down to. And that's what it's been for me after football. Bolu Olorumfami joining us here on the podcast. Follow him on Twitter at the only Bolu. I'm on Twitter at Brian Fenley. <laughs> Bolu, you had said that your mom is the strongest person you have ever met. I can see her strength through you right now, by the way, you are conveying your thoughts and how you're remembering your UCLA career. But why would you say that about your mom? What is it about her that gives you that insight? Man, it's, 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 I mean, uh, a lot of people know my dad passed away in 2015. That was towards the end of my freshman season. And I never really saw her, like, you know, lack or stop. You know, I never seen her stop. That's just, that's literally the, the number one thing that I model after is just, just don't stop. Don't give up. My mom never gave up. To this day, I just I still don't know how she did it. You know, my dad didn't leave us no life insurance or anything. So my mom made some, you know, made ends meet. And she just because she just kept working and she knew, you know, I have to pick it up. And I, I love her for that. And, you know, she she was able to, to act as a mother and a father for me, you know. And I was grateful to have my father for 18 years. Um, and my mom just she's incredible and she just never ever ever stops like i have to be the one to be like can you please just just rest take a nap for me please <laughs> yeah because like, i have one parent i have one mom and i can't i can't go without you right now i need you to you know stay breathing i will take i am here 
I'm doing what I'm doing to take care of you. And truthfully, I am because I feel like I'm family oriented. I'm building for a family I don't even have. And I'm building for my mother. I'm helping for my mom. I wanted to retire. I wanted to be able to see the fruits of her labor because of how hard she worked for me. You know, and, and I mean, I was in college for what, four years. My dad died my freshman year. And I never had to really go home a lot because it was like, I need help. I need, she, she was always like, don't worry. I, it's okay. Everything is good. She did a really good job. My other brother got a scholarship to Weber State. So, like, you know, it, to me, it shows like, wow. You know, you, you lost your husband, but you were still able to help to, to, to take care of three kids, one in college, and still develop others. And and one now, she doesn't have to pay college fees for her. So that's two in a row, and I'm just like, good job, Mom. That's all you. Just keep it going. My other <laughs> brother's playing basketball, so we're like, hey, get it, get on it. We got to train. We, you know, Mom can't pay a dime now. And then my last one, we're not sure what he's going to do. We don't know what he's going to do yet. He wants to play football because, you know, he sees a lot of us doing it. But you know what? I think we we're just a blessed family. But it, 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 we're just all emulating my mom and my dad. You know, work hard. Us, you know, you, there isn't a reason. There should never be a reason why you, you don't do anything, you know. So I learned a lot from my mom. I feel the same way as you, Bolo. I lost my dad to cancer when I was in high school. And so my mom – yeah, so – it was a five-year ordeal, and it took us across the country trying to find some way to help him. And he had a really rare form of cancer with with head and neck. So, wow. you know, at one point, you know, the surgery and it left. It, 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 basically, they tried to get some of the cancer out of his neck, and it, he did everything. Like Bolu, he wanted he wanted to die. If he had, if he knew he had to die, he wanted to know that he was fighting it and that he was going to die from the chemotherapy and not from the cancer itself. And I, I feel like that fighting, that never give up mindset translates to you and your family as well. Like, we're going to find a way. It might not be easy. And you know what you guys had to go through to make it happen. And, but, and now you can see where you are now and, and how that ha has paid off for you. Right. How have you honored your dad? And I know that there was a game. Was it against UNLV? Was it on his birthday? It was, when it was the first touchdown I ever got. It was my second year. Yep, UNLV. I remember that. It was played 10-10, 27, 16. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, that was. I mean, I was one of you know a couple others you know across the years. Um, but I feel like, you know, I feel like I honored my dad the, the minute he came to see the last game he saw. My dad. Got to see him play in one game my freshman year, wow. and it was Virginia, and I played. And he came with his oxygen tank and everything. I I felt like at that moment the pride he had and you know the happiness in his heart. He was like, I'm happy. Like I don't have to worry. I I, I got to see that. That's the part of the reason why I, I don't really get sad a lot because I I honestly I honestly feel like you know. My dad got my dad got sick, you know, trying to help us and my family, you know, because he knew he couldn't stop no matter what. Took took me to camps when he was sick. Uh, uh, flew me to uh, Northwestern to just to be a part of the process. Him and my uncle. Him and my my uncle got to see me get recruited before he died too. And then right after my uncle died, my dad died two years like a year and a half later. They they were like inseparable. So um, and they were the same, you know, building for family. Um, and, and, and never stopping, always always having to hustle. I remember my dad, I used to follow my dad. He used to do medical supplies. He used to deliver them all across the state. I would always be there with him. He would go to Redding, California, from Fresno, California, go to San Diego from Fresno, California, dropping off beds, building beds, power wheelchairs, all that type of stuff. We were doing all that. He did that as a hustle. So then he started selling, sending cars overseas, import, export, doing that as a hustle. My dad did everything while working at Caltrans as an engineer, very, he was a really smart guy. Like, I mean, I didn't get any of that from him. He, I, I, hate, math. I hate math. I think if anything, maybe I got his, his intellectual uh, parts of him. My dad was a very religious man and he spent a lot of his days in his room, locked up, reading his Bible and praying. Um, I used to type his sermons for church. I used to type it up on the computer because we used to have a, a projector. And I used to go through everything. You know, my dad was a very, very, very religious person. And um, I, I really feel like for me to honor him, I mean, 
I know I know I made him proud, but for me to fully feel like I honor him, I, I feel like I would want to fulfill what he wanted to fulfill, which is spread the message to the people. My dad, all my dad ever wanted to do was just preach and, and be an evangelist, whether it be about religion or whether it just be about life, sure. whether it be about experience. And I feel like I picked that up from him. He wanted to travel the world. That was his, I remember him saying, like, I want to travel to travel the world and preach and talk to different people. And I feel like uh, in order for me to honor him, I need to do that. And I plan on doing that. I plan on being a spokesperson. I, I plan on saying the things that people want to hear, but they themselves wouldn't say it, but they want to hear. So I, I, that's why, that's why when you hit me up to do this, I was like, no brainer. I want <laughs> I, I literally want to because I want people to hear what's in my mind. I want Absolutely. To hear my mind because I feel like I've been quiet for a while ever since I left UCLA. And, man, I love that school. I love – I think back to a lot of things that went down. You know, it, it made me who I am, and I will never regret ever um, what that school gave me, an education, a degree, experience, relationships, a lot of things. Um, so I'm grateful to be a part of this. You know, my dad would be proud to be able to – to, for me to be able to speak my mind and be able to send a message, you know, I, I don't believe in pointless banter. I feel like there's every time someone speaks, there's there's something they may be saying that you should be catching on to because you never know why they were there in your life, why are they put there in your life to speak for any reason. So I, I'm always attentive and I'm always myself trying to speak because you know, I like, you know, to have conversations. I like to talk about things. And, and I think that's one thing I picked up after my dad died and I didn't even know I picked it up. It's just, it just came to me naturally. And, and it's something that he always was a big advocate of just speaking your mind and always having a message for people because you know, you never know what anyone's going through. So maybe your words may help them, you know, just like I hear some things from people that help me. And it's just like, they would be like, my words help you. Be like, you never know. It doesn't matter what position yeah. you're in. Like literally it's, like right now in this situation, this is the reason why this is such a big thing in the world is because the rich people feel it too. The middle class feel it. And of right. course, the poor people feel it. Everyone is feeling it. If this was something else where only a part of percentage wasn't feeling it, it'd be a different thing. But the fact of the matter is everybody is being affected by it. So it just shows you like, wow, it doesn't matter what your position is. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter really who you know. It's really about, you know, what, what you're giving back to the world, you know, what energies are you giving back to the world? Because, you know, that may be the reason why you're going through what you're going through. There are people, there is a percentage of people who are thriving right now, you know, yeah. and that's just because they've been giving good energy to the world and the world is just giving it back. So it's like, it's almost like, think about it. If you're struggling right now, what, if, what, what were you doing? What have you been doing for the last couple, last couple of weeks, last couple of years? Do you, do you talk mess on people? Do you speak energies, good things to the world? Are you positive? You know, I always, I always try to check myself, like, all right, stop being negative. There are days where I could be negative, but I'm just like, no, don't be in that too much. Like, I remember, um, what's his name? He came to, he came to our school. He spoke to us for a while. Uh, I forgot his name. He works with Russell Wilson, Russell Wilson's uh, mental coach, forgot his name, but he said, it's not a bad thing to be negative. It's not, it's about how long you are negative. Like, oh. you know what I mean? It's, yeah. It, Think about it. We're human. I can't always just be like, things are going to be good. Things are going to be good. You're, you're always constantly thinking. That's why as you get older and as you get wiser and you can control your thoughts, which is why people do meditation, people do yoga, that's when you start to under filter and control your thoughts. And that's how I, something I noticed with my dad. He was able to control his thoughts. He was The way he was positive was like, it was like a positivity, like no matter what, wow. there's something good in this. And, and, him dying, like when my, my mom said when he did, because I remember they flew me out. Um, I didn't know anything was happening. It was the last final my freshman year, and I just get a call randomly uh, from uh, my mom's number, but somebody on her phone, like, you need mm -hmm. to come home. People are crying in the background. I'm like, what is going on? I, and I knew my dad was sick. I didn't know it was this bad. Sure. So UCLA flew me out, and thank, thank you to them. They flew me out right away. Coach P drove Coach Palomalu, this is when he was the coach. He mm -hmm. drove all the way from Pasadena to the office. He didn't have to be there that day. Like I said, this is everyone is this is finals, and he all he does is he pulls me in his office and just hugs me and starts crying because he, he lost his dad at eighteen too, and he felt you know he knew what I was going through and what could happen or what happened, you know what ended up happening. You know, 
flew me out. We, I went out there and I was able to see him, you know, on the bed. And I was able to hold his hand and kind of feel him. And I was just like, I was just like, you know what? This At this point, he's suffering, you know, just keeping him there. I could tell, like, he was saying, my mom was like saying he, he was kind of like, he wanted to let us, let him go. He's, he's done what he can do. You know, it's almost like control what you can control. I mean, he couldn't control anything at that point. And, yeah. and that taught me a lot about me. I mean, that, that taught me a lot because I'm just like, in order, in order for me to feel like that, you have to feel like you've done enough for the world. You, 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 you've done what you can do. You know, you felt like you are at peace with yourself because of what you've done out there, because of what you've been preaching, because you know, within your heart, the, the wrong you've done and the wrong you're trying to right, you've been trying to do right because everyone does wrong. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm perfect. I'm not sure. perfect. And that's another thing from learning at UCLA. I made my mistakes. I definitely have. Looking back on it, it's like, you know, a lot of it, we like to blame somebody. The human sure. nature did blame people. And I feel like my dad never blamed anyone. Never blamed anyone when he was sick. Never. I've never seen him blame anyone. It was just, it was like he felt like he is the reason why this is happening, which is why he, he made such a turnaround in being, his positivity was so healthy and was so, because some people's positivity is kind of corny and it kind of almost like makes you cringe a little bit like, hey, okay, yeah. okay, I get it, I get it. No, his positivity was like welcoming. It's like, I want to be, I want to feel like that. I want to be able to be happy just all the time because I feel like, man, I've done so much. It's not about how much money I, I have. It's about what I've done for the people around me, uh, the people who, who feel me, the people who do know me, people who don't. It's just it's the impact you have. And that was my father. And he had such an impact. His, his funeral was just packed. Packed. Even, I, I was like, wow. This this is, if, this, if he could see it, and he probably did see it, it was just, people were outside. It was so powerful to people. Like, some people couldn't even, they, they just checked in and had to go because they couldn't. It was so... It was, my dad had such an impact and it was things that it was people that I'm learning he had an impact on. I'm like, wow, like imagine the impact he had on me and look at these people crying like they're his kid. It just shows how much of an impact he has. And I would, it just shows how lucky I was to have him as my father. So um, I hope that answers your question. I yeah. Know I, I know. I, I no, I love hard, this, but yeah, I, I feel your father's unconditional love with you. And I think that's what comes across. He did everything he could to try to support you guys going above and beyond the call of duty to make it happen. You noticed that as well. And I go back to learning about how you came as a family to the United States and what actually had to happen for your family to be able to get here. So... So this, this, this thing they do in Nigeria, uh, I don't know if they still do it. It's called like a lottery system. This is where you put your name in it and you get a, a visa card to come to America. And so my dad, my dad and my mom, they put their names in it and, and my name and me and my mom got it. So me and my mom actually came to America first. We were in America for about eight months before my dad came. So it's basically a, a lottery system where you can plug your name in and you can get lucky because people in Nigeria are trying to get out in their minds. They're like, I want to go abroad. I want to get an opportunity, American dream, all of that. So that's how that took place. Um, when we first got here, when my mom, me and my mom got here, we actually landed in Tennessee with no money, nowhere, no idea where we were supposed to go. And we were actually blessed by someone. Someone bought us our bus ticket all the way to California. And yeah, yeah. It's insane. I, I forgot the lady's name. I got to ask my mom. But yeah, so someone paid for a bus ticket. And then we stayed with our cousins in Fresno, California until my dad came. My dad originally wanted us to live in a big city like LA, New York, Chicago. But then the way Fresno is, it's like really a fr uh, family oriented city slash town type of way. So it's like he kind of just was just like, you know what, this is good enough. And we ended up staying in Fresno. And that's just how my hometown became my hometown. I mean, it would be crazy if I went to Chicago or New York. I always wonder, like, what if we went somewhere else? But we ended up staying in California. I definitely love that. I mean, California, the most beautiful state. But that's the story behind how we wow. came here. Yeah. It was just me, my mom, and my dad. So 
all my other brothers were born here in America. I'm the only one that was born in Nigeria. Wow. And you were, what I've read is you were two years old. And I was, uh, yeah, two years old, 1999. Years old. I was two years old. Born in Nigeria, two years old. Your family says, we want to make our lives better as a family. We make that lottery in the visa, and then we come to the United States. And just all across your, your life, what I'm hearing, Bolu, is that your family finds a way. Exactly. <laughs> that, that, that seems to be the, the underlying theme here, is that count us out, think we can't do it, feel like we can't make it, we always find a way. And I think that is probably the biggest point I'll take from this conversation and what I feel is going to be one of the most inspiring things for our listeners and our viewers here to check out is how you've been able to do this with setback after setback, but you find a way. You learn that from your family, your father, your mother, and your siblings. And look at you now. I mean, you are creating such a great professional career and have so much in front of you. And I want you to know, Bolu, that this platform is always open for you. And we're just getting this started. We've had some really awesome guests. You are one of them. And it's, it's really cool because the UCLA community has really, really taken a liking to this little interview format because it's like it gives fans something to think about sports-wise and, and reconnect with their, their legends and stars while there's not sports going on. So I just wanted to say thank you for having – the, the openness to share your story. It's inspiring to me. I know a lot of people are going to be inspired as well. And I would love Bolo to do this again. Of course. Of course. I'm here. I love doing these things. I really do. I really do.